Please welcome to the TEDx stage, Darren Jaffe. Thanks, Todd. So who am I? What do I do? Why am I here talking to you? One of the things I do is I teach people to grow food at home, in their schools, and in their communities. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about, but I do want to show you a little bit about that first. Some of what I do is design gardens in urban spaces, small spaces, backyards, schools, and the like. This is a raised bed kit, simple, garden to go. What we try to do is make organic gardening fun, easy, simple. This is a three foot by six foot bed. It's made of sustainably harvested western red cedar. As you can see, it's easy to put together. You can put these on, ideally, an open flat ground like you see here, or you can put this on a slope. Just remember to dig down deep to the lowest point where you're building it. Now, while this is ideal on ground, you can also put these on patios and driveways and the like. It's pretty easy, though leveling sometimes can be a little tricky. Now, the big secret to a good garden is not necessarily the seeds and plants you choose, but the soil that you use to grow them. Plants are like humans. Grow healthy, eat healthy, grow healthy. Here I'm adding the Farmer D planting mix, which is made of compost, peat humus, and pine bark, rich in microorganisms, bacteria, and fungi that plants need to grow healthy. The final ingredient is organic fertilizer, which is the perfect complement to enliven and feed the plants. Now, Fall in this area is a great time to garden. You could pretty much grow three seasons here. What you see going in here are cool season vegetables and herbs. Carrots, kale, lettuce, chard, and the like. Other benefits of a raised bed garden are that you get increased production, an aesthetic, very few weeds, and not a lot of work. Now, one of the key pieces to a successful garden is drip irrigation. So you want to make sure that when you're away, your plants are going to still get water. Now this reduces runoff and conserves water while reducing the evaporation as well. The food that you grow in these gardens tastes amazing, partly because of the soil and the organics that are used to grow them, but also because it's farm to table. Your, tra your food is only traveling maybe five feet or 15, 15 minutes, you know, five minutes or 15 feet instead of thousands of miles. So there's an instant organic garden, easy to make. But that's not really why I'm here to talk to you. It's not about why, how to grow a garden so much as why you should. It all started really with a turkey sandwich. <clears throat> when I was a freshman, I was a bit of a deadhead, and I did what most freshmen deadhead would do, skip class and go to the nearest sandwich shop. So while I was eating this turkey sandwich, I was staring at this sandwich and kind of pondering its whereabouts, its origins. And then it hit me. I had never grown anything I'd ever eaten. Of the thousands of meals, this was the first one to stare me back in the face and make me ask the question, where did you come from? Who grew you, and how did they do it? After this sandwich that changed my life forever, I started learning about agriculture and quickly realized the consequences of big agriculture and how things have gone awry, and I mean radically awry.
I reformed my college experience. I dropped out of school. <laughs> They didn't have a degree in organic farming at the time. This was 1994. And I started self-educating myself. I went to farming workshops, I read books, I became passionate about learning. And what I discovered really changed my perspective. I started working on organic farms, and I came home to my, I came home to my parents, actually, to announce to them that I'd made this decision to change my college career. And as you can imagine, the parents' response, well, no tuition, no more dead tours. But they would do, they, they, they reacted in a way where they were a little shocked. Well, okay, Farmer D, let's see where this goes. Little did I know, I'm still practicing this as a career over 15 years later. What I want to share with you today are some of the things I've learned. If you go back to some of those original farming workshops that I went to back in the early days, this is kind of what I call the dirty dozen. One is that the ingredients in that sandwich could have easily traveled over 3,000 miles, eating up its own share of fossil fuels on its way and leaving behind a trail of carbon dioxide and pollution. Thank you. Like plants, we all need water. Our agriculture and our food has become heavily dependent on oil. Refrigeration, trucks, tractors, and chemicals, all petroleum-based. It's amazing to me how people think more about the calories they consume and are pretty much unaware of the chemicals and the impact those have on their bodies and the environment. Bees are critical to the health of agriculture. And because of pollution and pesticides, cell phones, and the commercialization of the bee industry, the bees are facing colony collapse disorder worldwide. Did you know that one out of every three bites of food you take is dependent on the pollination from a honeybee? No more tomatoes, no more bees, no more tomatoes on that turkey sandwich. Topsoil is essential, and big ag has been depleting topsoil faster than it can replenish it. For every bite of food you take, six units of that food is lost in topsoil. Biodiversity. Engineered agriculture produces genetically modified tomatoes, for example, with tough skins that can weather a long journey cross-country. Pretty? Maybe. Tasty? Definitely not. Biodiversity, sorry, uh, monocultures, have, uh, monocultures growing single crops in mass have developed resistance to super pests and super diseases that require more chemicals each year to, to continue to maintain the productivity. Nitrogen in agriculture, ammonium nitrate, is a chemical fertilizer that wreaks havoc on the environment when it runs off, for example, the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. It's actually quite ironic when you think about America's favorite fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, is also Afghanistan's most popular explosive. When we look at the way our meat is grown, it's a rather grim sight as well. Big ag, packs cows, chickens, goats, pigs into very tight quarters, horrendous growing conditions to maximize profits. And in these instances, the manure becomes a pollutant to the environment, and the health of the meat affects the antibiotics and the hormones used to produce big, fat, fast commercial meat is also wreaking havoc on the environment and our health. Subsidies from the government to grow corn and soybeans have really fostered a cheap food system where buying cheap, high-sugar, high-fat, high-salt food 
it's cheaper than buying vegetables. And it's no wonder, and this is a, these are abundant everywhere, every food you look at. So it's no wonder why we have such a huge issue with obesity and diabetes. Not to mention the health, the health concerns that come from that. Most people don't even realize that they're consuming industrial food, nor the consequences that are a result of that. So, enough of what's wrong. How do we make it right? Rudolf Steiner, a 20th century Austrian philosopher, helped us see a type of agriculture that looked called biodynamic farming, holistic approach to farming, that looked at the earth as sacred, and really had a, teaching us the ancient ways of harnessing the cosmic and earthly forces that grow healthy food. This spiritual approach to farming very well may be the antidote to so many of the problems I've talked about. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to talk to you about gnomes and fairies or stuffing cow horns with manure under the full moon, though I'd really like to, but not today. Ancient people, indigenous people, were connected to these cycles, the days, cycles of the seasons, We have lost connection to those cycles. Our cell phones, our iPads, our iPods, our iPhones, our TiVo, our TV, continues to further disconnect us. These ancient people, their internet was the solar system. When you garden, you develop a deeper understanding of these cycles. You reconnect to nature and to those forces that grow our food. Now, it's not just those forces of nature that many of which we've experienced in a dramatic way recently, but also the nature of those forces and understanding what drives them. Now, biodynamics it's not really that much more mystical than the farmer's almanac, planting with the cycles of the moon and the stars, whipping up some old-time potion to control pests or disease. Now, there are some aspects of it that may be a little hard to swallow for the uninitiated, like planting leafy vegetables during a water sign, when the moon is in a water sign. I'm going to take you back to some of my early farming days and show you a few lessons about the difference between biodynamic farming and conventional agriculture. Animals play a key role on the farm. I had cows, that is me, chickens, pigs, goats. Now, each animal plays a specific role on the farm. Chickens, for example, are, their manure composted is really good for fruiting vegetables cow manure for leafy greens, and pigs for potatoes, and sometimes cows for patients. Another lesson number two, polyculture versus monocultures. This was one of my, my old farms, Earth Song. We would grow dozens of different varieties of crops and dozens of varieties of each crop in order to maximize the ecological diversity on the farm. Whereas monoculture often grows one crop or one animal, throwing the balance of ecology out of whack. Lesson number three, nitrogen. In biodynamic farming, we get nitrogen into the soil using cover crops like legumes, peas, vetch, and beans, which actually harvest nitrogen out of the atmosphere and pump it into the soil. When we turn these crops under, it's called a green manure. In conventional agriculture, this would be deemed non-productive. These crops are not harvested for food, they're, they're plowed back under. You're investing in the soil. Lesson number four, compost heals the soil. Well, heals the soul too, maybe. Um, here, 
biodynamic farmers, like, like we add vitamins to our diet, biodynamic farmers add herbs to their compost. Chamomile, yarrow, dandelion, valerian, stinging nettle are some of the essential herbs used to add to the compost to impart healing properties to the soil and to grow healthier plants and animals. Now, I loved farming. I love farming. But I realized in order to turn the tide of the destructive nature of our society on agriculture, the environment, and human health, it was going to take more than one organic, being, just being one organic farmer. So I decided to take the Johnny Appleseed approach. I sold the farm, and I began taking the lessons I had learned and taking them out to share them with the world. Now, I want to share with you what it takes as a Johnny Appleseed of organic farming to make a change to shift our food culture. I've been very fortunate to have a relationship with Whole Foods. This is their dump trailer, and that's 40,000 pounds of rotten organic vegetables and fruits. I've been working with Whole Foods in the southeast for about five years, redirecting their waste from the landfill, where it would cause methane gas and one of the most harmful greenhouse gas, and divert it to a compost facility near Savannah. Now, if you compost at home, one family could produce 10 pounds of compost easily a week, a waste, whereas a grocery store chain could produce 10 times 10,000 pounds of grocery waste per week. Imagine the reduction in food waste and the, the production, the amount of soil we could generate. And this is just one small grocery chain that directs over a million pounds per quarter. Here are the, here are the compost piles. Now, producing quality compost at this scale is no easy task. So again, using the biodynamic preparations and the herbs, here I'm stirring the herbs for the compost. We try to increase the quality um, of the compost and enrich the final product. And here is the final product. This is a bulk load going back to a farm, which in some cases returns produce right back to Whole Foods. Here's bagged product on the shelf outside the front of every Whole Foods in the Southeast, and educating the consumer about why it's important to compost and close the loop. Another way I take a Johnny Appleseed approach is I work with cities. Recently, I worked with the city of Swanee to develop one of the largest community gardens in the country. This is about 40 miles from Atlanta, and there's already an eager list of gardeners waiting to get their plots. I also work with private developers, helping them to integrate farms and gardens into their master plans. This is a project in New Jersey, where the farm, about 10 acres, provides food, herbs, vegetables, eggs, meat, to the restaurant, and to the culinary school, and soon to be a hotel and spa. This is a newly seeded project in the Florida Panhandle called Longleaf Preserve. Here, a Farmer D Farm anchors a 2,500-acre community that is surrounded by a 50,000-acre preserve. Now, going back to the video earlier, you saw how easy it was to build a small garden. Here's an example of a larger backyard garden in the home of one of Atlanta's most dedicated environmentalists, Laura Turner Seidel. I must say, though, my most passionate part of my work is working with young people. I've built farms for youth prisons, for boys' homes, and for a, locally a camp for children with special needs. Here in the Atlanta area, in the past year and a half, my company's designed and built over 50 school gardens. And we're teaching children about where their food comes from. It's amazing to me the story after story after story I hear from teachers and parents alike, how children don't know where their food comes from. A lot of them think it grows in the grocery store. Carrots grow on trees. They just they don't know. And they're so much more likely to eat the food they grow and pick. They'll, they'll actually eat it. One of my goals, in addition to regionalizing, taking the model with Whole Foods and taking it to other regions, I also have a vision of actually bringing school, bring, we believe that every school should have a garden. And one of our big missions in the company, and personally, is to bring gardens to every school. 
And that brings us back to the fateful turkey sandwich. And as you heard, my mission really is to teach and inspire you, too. Not just to be consumers of healthy, good food, but to become co-producers. Whether it's a basil plant on the patio, a compost bin in the backyard, or a backyard garden. Learn to appreciate your food. Enjoy the good taste of fresh food. Gardens teach about the heart and soul of food. So the next time you eat that turkey sandwich, give it some thought. Thank you. <laughs>